with critical mass. So um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're happy to have with us today Ahmed El Khadi. Ahmed is a group leader uh, from the University of Consent and a visiting scientist in Prince, from Princeton University. Uh, he previously worked with Fred Wolf and Theo Giselle on optogenetics and electrophysiology as a tool to study dynamics of neurons. He's also been studying decision making and evidence accumulation in animals. Uh, he has won multiple awards in the field and he's a co-organizer of several workshops and meetings, including the NeuroBridge Summer School Series, which brings together scientists from the Middle East, and of the Mathematical Theory of Deep uh, Learning in Princeton. Uh, today, Ahmed will talk about uh, novel brain imaging technique using functional ultrasound and how it can be used in behaving animals. Ahmed, nice to have you. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, uh, speaking today at the seminar, although I would have loved to have it in person, hopefully uh, in the coming year when we are all post-COVID. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about, as Jonathan said, about a new uh, imaging technique that have been emerging during uh, the last few years. It's called functional ultrasound imaging during um, functional ultrasound imaging. So as a system neuroscientist uh, and those in the audience system neuroscientists can relate to this, our dream is to be re able to relate how many multi multiple brain areas in the brain interact with each other to give rise to uh, animal behavior. Conventionally, uh, systems neuroscientists have studied uh, behavior in what I will call a bit of a constricted uh, setups like having trial-based structures, either in a head fix preparation or in an operant chamber. Usually you had short time scale trials and uh, you record from single or brain areas. So this is changing in the last few years. So seeing the future, I think we should be pushing the boundaries into extending uh, behaviors into more naturalistic ones that happen over extending time scale and continuous and happening in freely moving uh, animals. Today, I'm not going to focus a lot on the behavior, but I will focus on the issue of being able to get brain-wide um, information that underlies behavior. So just to give you an outline of the talk, I will first begin by the brain-wide imaging techniques that I, that I will present today and two uh, uh, behaviors in which I have used this technique, the mom said social vocal communication and rest decision making, and I will end my talk uh, with uh, future directions. So the brain-wide brain, brain -wide imaging, um, Ultimately, let's imagine what, what, I would, what would be the dream uh, techniques that I would like to have is a technique that will be able to image cortical and subcortical areas simultaneously, provide me with an unbiased screening, it can be used in freely moving animals. Also, it would be even better if we don't need to use genetic markers. And if we don't need to use genetic markers, we can use it across animals so we can do a comparative approaches in brains of different species. Here, I just put the techniques that are used in systems and cognitive neuroscience across different skill. And the techniques that satisfy all the criteria that I just said is a technique called functional ultrasound imaging. And because it's a new technique, I'm going to go into the physics of how it, uh, how it works to, to clarify what type of signal that this technique is picking up. So functional ultrasound, you hear it, you remember when you go, when a woman goes to a doctor and do a ultrasound, that's exactly the same technique, but now it's miniaturized in order to look into the brain. And what you have is a probe that sends acoustic um, signals into the brain, so ultrasound, and then gets reflected into the brain. And what you read out is that the, the time it takes to go back to the probe will tell me information about the position of the particles that have reflected this wave. And the changes amplitude of the wave will tell me about changes in the density of the area in which this reflection happened. So what is changing density uh, inside the brain? So let's uh, think about it. You have, if you have change in neural activity, with, by neurovascular coupling, usually you have vasodilation. And vasodilation change the density of, um, of red blood cells per um, uh, volume. And this is exactly what the functional ultrasound imaging technique picks up, is the changes in the cerebral blood volume. So what kind of spatial resolution 
does one get? One can get a special resolution of 150 micrometer by 150 micrometer by 400 micrometer. And this depends on the uh, design of the uh, probe. And this is a probe that I'm, I will be using throughout the whole uh, talk. So, but remembering this, okay, when, when I say cerebral blood volume, we think about the hemodynamic signal and also functional MRI and the issue of the temporal uh, resolution. So it is still limited by the hemodynamic response, but we can sample, we can get sampling rates from two hertz up to 10 hertz. Okay. So what about the functional resolution? So before, before I go on with, um, with my behavioral experiments, I really wanted to test what is the functional resolution of uh, this technique, the functional ultrasound imaging using the probes that I have. So if what we are looking, we, in order to do this, we use a system that we already know what kind of responses we get, and this is a whisker stimulation. And we can do single, we, we are able to detect a single whisker uh, stimulation, and here what we are able to detect is, for this is the C2 uh, whisker, and we are able to detect the, the barrel in the somatosensory cortex in which um, C2 is um, represented. We can do this here. You can look at the changes in the cerebral blood volume over time. You can see it takes about two seconds to rise and then it decay over around uh, three seconds. And here it's over 24 trials, but you can get this responses from just 10 trials. And this as here are the uh, single trials. Moreover, I also did experiments in order to see, okay, can I differentiate between the C2 and C3 uh, whiskers? And this is possible using the, this technique, functional ultrasound image. So this is just a validation steps to give you an idea what are the, because it's a new technique, what are the physical basis of this technique and what kind of um, theoretical resolution you get and what is the functional resolution that you get. So moving on, <coughs> As I mentioned, we will have two experimental studies uh, today in which I will use functional ultrasound imaging, which is a marmoset vocal communication and rats evidence accumulation based decision making. And the point I would like to make is that we, using the functional ultrasound imaging, we are able to get large brain coverage during naturalistic and freely moving behaviors. So let's get going. So first, the studying the brain networks underlying social vocal communication in marmoset monkeys. Marmoset monkeys are these very cute um, uh, monkeys. They are uh, new world monkeys. They are highly vocal and highly social. And marmosets use their um, different vocalizations according to the different social contexts. So let me just introduce what are the different vocalizations that, that the marmoset uses in different uh, social context. So when two marmosets are, are far apart, they, they produce something called the long distance contact calls. It's either a fee call or a Twitter call. And, um, um, and yeah, maybe, I, I don't know whether you can hear the sound. Um. So these are the spectrograms of the fee call and the Twitter call. And they both produced when the marmosets are far apart and um, from each other. So there is no not um, significant visual information. And as they get closer to each other, when there is more uh, visual information, so short, short distance contact call, they produce either a call called trail fee or another call called trail. So this is a very rich uh, behavior in which the vocalization of the, uh, of the primate reflects some kind of social context. So there have been a big history in, in the field in order to understand what is the brain areas uh, and networks that are underlying this vocal communication. So this is just um, some summary of the general behavior. You should have a motor, a motor part which produce the vocalization, and then the auditory part that perceives the vocalization. But then the, the, the big question remains, what is driving both parts, either the motor for the production or the auditory and the perception in order to produce different vocalization in different social contexts? So 
we went back and did some literature research to see what to, to study what are the brain areas that have been studied in the literature before using electrophysiology on the interface of both social behavior and vocalization. And first, there is what we call the social behavior network that have been studied in marmoset monkeys that involves the lateral septum, the ventral medial hypothalamus, the pre-optic area, and the periaqueductal area. And this is what we call a social behavior network. And what we are looking at here is a sagittal, is a, is a sagittal plane at the uh, medial, uh, the exact midline. We also looked at the uh, areas at the, in the same, in the same like sagittal planes that, that have been reported to be involved in vocalizations. And we find areas that are overlapping with the social behavior network and other areas like, again, the ventromedial hypothalamus, pre-optic area, periaqueductal gray, posterior hypothalamus, and anterior cingulate cortex, and medial salus. So we formed the hypothesis that there, there should be a social vocal uh, network that basically modulates the vocalization according to a certain social context. And this is what we, the areas that we came up with, and exactly what I, I, I said in the last slides, this is the overlap between the social behavior network and the social vocal network. So, which technique can allow us to measure all these areas simultaneously today in a behaving uh, marmoset today there is no other technique other than functional ultrasound image and moreover we think that this social vocal network is the one basically this drives that is basically contextualizing both the motor and and um, uh, contextualizing both the motor sensory uh, uh, behaviors to, to be to produce a certain vocalization at a specific social context. So to record the activity from all these brain areas simultaneously, as I mentioned, the only possible technique that we can use is the functional ultrasound imaging to image from all these areas simultaneously. So let me go into the experimental uh, design. And here on, on the right side, we are looking at the sagittal uh, cross section the exact planes that I uh, uh, just showed where, where the brain areas are. And this is the position of the ultrasound probe. And there is some ultrasonic gel, this is such details. We are able to image in a 20 millimeter depth and 16 millimeter anterior in the anterior posterior axis in the sagittal, just over here. So while, while the marmoset has the, the probe attached to, uh, to it and, and the imaging is happening, oh, what hi. is our Yes. So, what about the thickness of the of the slice? It's always a, it's always a slice, one slice. Yes. It's, it's one sli yes, it's one slice. The thickness is four hundred micrometer. And can, in, in, uh, in general, can you do whole a whole brain imaging, or it's uh, it's? Yes, I will. Uh, yeah, I will address this in, in at the end. Okay. So for now, for now, the technique for the free moving, for the more free moving configuration can be done in 2D. And to get more slices, you can just move the probe either with a motor or just moving it from session to session. And I had fixed preparation. I will, I will show from our collaborators, they can do 3D um, uh, functional ultrasound damage. But for now, it's, it's uh, what I'm talking about, the 2D um, uh, configuration. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, so the, the experiment is the marmoset is uh, sitting just on a chair with its head free uh, moving um, on one side of the room and there is a curtain and on the other side uh, there is a speaker that produces uh, vocalization. And here to study um, uh, the sensory uh, perception, we did a block design in which we have a 16 second of uh, stimulus, which are the calls. So the different type of calls that I mentioned before. And, and there is an interblock interval of 25 seconds to 50 seconds, and then another block of calls, and we randomize them in order to be able to study the sensory uh, uh, response to different type of calls. Okay, so what type of general responses do we get? Before moving over uh, on this, you might be wondering, okay, how do we, how do we align, you know, I, I'm, I showed this atlas in which I have brain areas and then I have this functional ultrasound uh, imaging uh, data. So just 
the to because I will be reporting brain areas afterwards. How do we get from the functional ultrasound image to know which area we are uh, recording from? Is that we align the functional ultrasound image to a light sheet to uh, this is here the red um, structure here. This is a light sheet imaging of an eye discocleared marmoset brain. So after each um, experiment, so we did five marmoset. After each experiment, we clear the brain uh, of the marmoset. We do imaging and then we align it to the functional ultrasound imaging in order to register to uh, the marmoset atlas so that we have a precision of registration around 100 micrometer, which is pretty good. This allows us to be uh, sure about our annotation of the brain areas using a standardized atlas. So this is just to clarify to you, when, whenever I talk about brain areas afterwards, this, this has been the result of this uh, alignment and uh, registration procedure. So again, to remind you, this is the configuration in which we are imaging the, the sagittal plane. I, I keep repeating sagittal plane because we, we, are, we are usually not used on looking at uh, uh, sagittal planes uh, in depth. So what is a single, what would be the single session response? If I take all the calls and look, what is the response in, uh, in this medial uh, brain regions? So I'm gonna show you now um, a video um, eight seconds before the call uh, uh, plays. And then we will look at the responses uh, in the brain. So keep attend to the video. You have some fluctuations and then you have the calls playing and then you have this overwhelming response here, which this is a significant increase in the cerebral blood volume height. Okay, so we saw here, uh, if, if you noticed, I will play it again. There is a very large increase in this area here, if you focus. Yes, so this is the, this is the anterior cingulate cortex. So in order to show you how uh, good these responses are, let us look first at the anterior cingulate cortex be before mapping out all the areas that have been activated. So if we look at the uh, um, single trial response in the anterior cingulate cortex, we see here if this green, so on the x-axis x, x axis here we have the time, on the y-axis we have the uh, change in the cerebral blood volume. And the green here is uh, uh, um, the call that is being played. And we see that it's very reliable responses and on average around 20 to 30 percent increase in the cerebral blood volume. So this tells you about the sensitivity of the technique and also the large involvement of the anterior cingulate cortex in um, sensory perception. So what about other areas? So we can then map out the areas that are being, that are, that show a large increase in the cerebral blood volume during sensory perception of all calls and not now differentiating between different calls. If you take all the calls and look which areas are activated. And we begin to realize that we have uh, uh, areas that are very similar to the areas that we are, we hypothesized to be involved in what we call social vocal network. So let's uh, walk through them. Here's the major one are the supplementary motor area and the pre-SMA the lateral septum, the amygdala, this is the external amygdala, this is the limbic salamus. We can catch also the periaqueductal gray, then is the ventromedial hypothalamus, the anterior hypothalamus and preoptic area. So these are the areas identified. So what is, let's look at their dynamics. So we see that they have a variety of dynamics. We have areas that have increased in the response during sensory perception and sus some sustained response like lateral septum, medial dorsal salamis, and ACC, and some have an almost instantaneous response like the anterior hypothalamus and ventromedial hypothalamus. But also in areas, the motor areas specifically, we see a reduction in activity. So here, just to uh, clarify, what we see is a decrease in the activity. It doesn't say excitatory or inhibitory, it just tells you that this area has decreased in activity. 
So this made us think, so what, we, what about we build a correlation matrix to see how the areas are related to each other? So we, we saw that the motor areas during sensory perception are usually inhibited, which one would think is logical because you want to inhibit any, any vocal production during the perception of a call. And the areas that are activated are the ones involved in social behavior network, which includes the social context in which the animal uh, is. So to clarify again, this is, was one one set here. So we find this reproducible across our all data set in the five marmoset, and we can align them to our general uh, atlas, and we get 17 areas that are very significantly uh, activated during sensory perception. And the areas constitute what you have hypothesized to be the social uh, vocal network. So for example, the, the PEG lateral septum, the pre-optic uh, nucleus, and the hypothalamus was part of this uh, uh, vocal uh, network uh, along with the ACC. The pre-optic uh, nucleus and the thalamus was also part of this uh, vocal behavior map. So we are able, using the functional ultrasound, as you can see, to map many brain areas simultaneously that are involved in this behavior. So the next question, we were faced with, okay, here I have shown the activation across all calls. So what if I parse out the different calls? Like if I, if I take the fee call, the trill, uh, uh, trill fee, and Twitter. So um, it's, it's always, uh, for me, helpful to, to work with the hypothesis in mind. So our hypothesis if, is, was that if fee, Twitter, trill fee, and trill have social meanings, so they, they have to, the, the calls that have the similar social meaning should have similar activation pattern, and the ones that have different social uh, meaning should, should have different activation pattern, and the one who have the same social meaning so should have a very close, um, uh, similarly brain uh, activation. So, we did this by taking the activation maps during the fee call as a standard and then begin to compare it to Twitter, Trill fee, and Trill. So let's see what we got. Once we compare fee and Twitter, we basically get, um, we get areas, but they are not significantly activated. So if you look at the significantly activated different areas, you don't, you don't find almost any. So this means that fee and Twitter have similar activation maps in this medial brain region. And if you remember in, in my introduction, I saw that fee and Twitter are this long distance contact calls that have similar uh, social mean. So, and then if we compare fee to trill, we find difference in areas that are activated. Okay, this is the, the medium uh, distance uh, call. And then the trill fee that is activated at the very short distance see show larger increase. Okay, if this is is this some anecdotal uh, finding? Just one marmoset. So we went on and did it with all the data set, comparing, doing a cross correlation between the the brain maps, and then uh, doing a distance matrix on which we did a cluster hierarchical clustering in order to see. Okay, can we cluster? How does this, cl this uh, clusters of brain activation maps um, cluster whether together or differently? And we get the same ordering here. We, we, we see that Twitter and, and Fee uh, brain maps cluster closer to each other, and Trill and Fee are close to each other with the distance between Fee and Trill. So we, we get the same, what we call social ordering, when we do it with all our data. I'm not showing here the control. I can, I can show it if somebody wants to see it in the question that we had a control with a non-call, with a noise, which basically you get activation all over the place. So this is our control, was the noise. Noise that is uh, modulated to look like the, uh, the fee call, but it doesn't have a social content. So this is really nice because we, for the first time ever, we are able to, to really 
pin down what is the differential brain dynamics that, uh, that is representing this different social uh, uh, meaning of codes. So next, we move to the motor part. So now we, we really talked about the sensory perception. How do I perceive uh, the code? So we repeat the same um, experiments, but we leave the animal to produce um, uh, vocalizations spontaneously. Imaging exactly in the same uh, medial uh, brain region. And you can, the, from the first sight, you notice that there is more cortical activation during motor production. And another thing, you get very significant activation here down, this is in the pontine nuclei. These are the respiratory nuclei, and they are very significantly activated just before the vocalization. But in the same time, you get also uh, activation in the same social behavior network. And here, just to uh, show you the activation in the ACC, so here, this is a, a fee, a single uh, fee call, and this is aligned to um, the ACC that seems to be activated just before the talk call. So we do the same we did with the sensory perception to look at the differential activations in, in different areas. We have here this dotted line is the call onset. So we have areas that are activated before the call onset and some that take on after the call onset. And we see that ACC is you know, on the call onset that are activated, but the motor area, like uh, supplementary motor area, are activated as we would expect just before the onset of the call. And the same holds for this uh, respiratory areas, specifically the uh, reticular formation. And the uh, areas like lateral septum and, and ventromedial hypothalamus that are part of the social behavior network be, become activated just after the call onset. So again, you can see that using this um, uh, functional ultrasound imaging, we can get uh, pretty quickly a large number of areas that are involved in a behavior of interest for us. Here is the motor production. So we did the same like we did with the sensory perception. We said, okay, is the motor production of here we, between contact calls versus non-contact uh, calls is, is different or not. So the, the contact calls that we, uh, that we had in our marmoset produced is fee and trill, and the non-contact calls is something called the alarm call. Uh, it's usually like uh, their emergency uh, signal. So, of course, this is what we got, you know, we didn't get trill fee, it's because you leave the animal to uh, produce uh, vocalizations naturally. So this is the, the data that we, we, uh, we had to, to play with. So we saw that we can able basically to uh, differentiate between the contact calls and the non-contact calls. And the, the largest difference was there was in the non-contact calls, a larger involvement in the subcortical areas. Still this merit um, further investigation, but it gives you again an idea that um, we cannot just talk of vocal production. We uh, we should parse out what are you producing. Is this a contact call? The type of call uh, uh, is obviously involving and recruiting different brain areas when it is being produced. So another thing, you know, it have been conventional in uh, system neuroscience. So I, I, I uh, as you will see in the in the second half of the talk. Uh, training rats and uh, in other behaviors, people have been talking of history uh, dependence. So can we, in this naturalistic behavior, can we basically study the history dependence during this audio vocal uh, interaction that um, uh, I'm studying? Um, so how do we, how do, we uh, do it? So we, we have two scenarios. Uh, if I produce a vocalization now, it might be preceded by a spontaneous vocalization. So like a sequence of spontaneously uh, produced calls. Or it might be that I produce a vocalization now, but it is preceded by an external stimuli, like in this uh, playback experiment. So 
we basically then we separated this uh, trials that have a sequence of poles, one spontaneous and uh, 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 followed by another spontaneous call, and trials in which you have a playback, a stimulus, external drive, and the produced call. Can we get is that brain dynamics are different or not? And to our surprise, in the externally driven the externally driven um, uh, uh, vocalizations involved more of the subcortical areas and the social vocal network in comparison to the sequence of vocalizations that involved more of the cortical areas. So we can draw this uh, diagram here is that if I have a vocalization, if I have an externally driven social context, I recruit the social vocal network and then involve the medial, medial sensorimotor cortex, which is this um, upper area. But if I have an internally uh, driven um, uh, context, which is the sequence of calls, it basically get involved more of the medial sensorimotor cortex. So here, again, for the first time, we are complicating the image when it comes to uh, social vocal communications. That there is a, a, a a differential brain dynamics involved in either driving the vocalizations externally or it is being driven internally, like in, in a sequence of uh, vocalizations. So concluding the first part of my talk uh, for the process is we, there are two highlights today. Is the first one is we were able for the first time ever in the literature to delineate the social vocal network involved both in the uh, uh, sensory perception and the motor production of calls. And we have shown that you can get contextually modulated brain dynamics during audio vocal interaction. So I will move on then to the next part of my talk, which is the second case study, is using the functional ultrasound imaging during uh, behavior exhaustively studies, uh, uh, studied in system neuroscience, which is uh, evidence accumulation in this, uh, in uh, this cute right here, this lab rats. So the main, the main focus um, when studying evidence accumulation is that, uh, in, uh, in system neuroscience is to be able to map what we call a decision-making circuit. So decision-making circuit is how do I get the sensory information from the world and to produce some motor action. And throughout the uh, last, I would say, even decades, there have been many areas that have been uh, delineated to be involved in this process, either in monkeys or in, uh, in, in rats. So the idea was, okay, can we basically able to map out even more areas that are uh, involved during this process of evidence accumulation. So for those who doesn't know what evidence accumulation is, let me, let me explain to you uh, what it is. is if, if a rat enters into an operant chamber that have three pokes, the rat center poke, and then listen to auditory uh, clicks on either, uh, on the right, and uh, left side. And then at the end of the trial, the animal should orient to the side that had the highest number of clicks. And the process sought to underlie this behavior is an evidence accumulation, which is a kind of uh, integration. But to use ultrasound in it, we were faced by uh, um, a fundamental barrier. If, if, if you if you know the literature and evidence accumulation, you will know that people usually use trials that have a length of like 100 milliseconds, maximum up to 1.5 seconds. Unfortunately, for functional ultrasound, this basically will not work because of the slowness of the hemodynamic function. So the first task I had to do is to train rats to do the evidence accumulation task, but on extended time scale. So on extended time scale, meaning three up to five seconds, I can train them even to eight seconds. And for me, this sound, sounded like more 
kind of a more naturalistic time scale because I think they are, this is a domain of time scales that haven't been studied before, but in the same time will allow us to use functional ultrasound imaging during uh, uh, this process. I was lucky to be working in a lab that we can do a, a very large scale training in order because it's very hard to train the threads on, on, on this very long uh, trials, but we were successful in doing so. So how did we validate um, whether this worked for functional ultrasound or not? So first, the behavior works. So we are able to get uh, psychometric curves that looks like uh, rats who are doing trials on, uh, uh, are doing shorter trials. But the second thing, if you take a functional ultrasound image and look at the uh, frequency um, content of the, of the signal, you find that with this long trials, with this red line here, you are capturing the majority of the frequency uh, uh, content. But if you have 500 millisecond trial, for example, you are losing quite a bit from the signal. So this is the first hurdle. The second thing, the animals are doing this uh, in, in the marmoset case, the marmoset was sitting in a chair, but here we have a more difficult situation in which the animal is, is, is freely uh, moving. So would the animal behave in the same manner when we uh, tesser him with a, a functional ultrasound probe uh, or not? To give you the, uh, the pitch quickly, yes, when they are tessered, they behave the same. But we will delve now into more the experimental setup and what uh, we measured in the next slide. So to give you an, oh, why is this pixelated? Okay, uh, sorry about the pixelation of it. So the, to give you an idea about the experimental setup. So one thing maybe I didn't mention in the, in the marmoset, but I hope it was clear, we have to open a craniotomy, a cranial uh, window because the ultrasound uh, for now doesn't cross through uh, the scalp. So in, in the preparation here, we open a very large craniotomy in the red from um, around maximum eight millimeter by 19 millimeters. So it's almost the whole uh, skull. And then we have a head plate and some probe holder, and then we can have the uh, probe of the ultrasound in. And then I designed a tessering uh, setup that allows the animal uh, basically to move uh, freely in its, its cage while it's behaving and while we are imaging. So the next question, where to image? So again, we did, I did some literature research on the advantage of, function, of evidence accumulations as a lot have been studied in uh, single areas or multiple areas that can guide us. And I chose um, a sagittal plane that is a one millimeter lateral uh, uh, sagittal plane that allows me to catch almost more than, this is 53 uh, brain areas tumor genes. So using the same ultrasound probes that I used with, with uh, uh, marmoset monkeys, I was able to, to, to image at the depths of 15 millimeter and uh, anterior posterior uh, 16 millimeter. And 15 millimeter basically is the whole depth of that. So we can even see the uh, neck arteries of the, uh, of the red if we image uh, G. So this is very lucrative. I have all this, um, uh, brain areas simultaneously imaged. So but is it, but then, okay, I can image, but then we get instabilities, like it's unstable because the animal is moving around and stuff like this. But let's see how stable it is and whether it works or not. So just to give you an intuition, like let's look live at it, how the rat is behaving here. This is the tassering setup I, I mentioned, and the animal has uh, um, uh, the ultrasound probe in this uh, probe holder. And it's doing the evidence accumulation task. Sorry, there is no sound here. It's a very good red, very well trained, just center poking. And now is a list, he's listening to right and left clicks. And after five seconds, um, he will leave the center poke and go to the sides of his face. And we'll keep repeating this um, many times. Like we can get on average 200 to 300 trials uh, a session. Um, so what is happening in the brain? Uh, while uh, the animal is behaving. Let's look on the right side. So just to orient, to, uh, orient you again, uh, that we are looking at a, uh, this lateral sagittal plane, one millimeter lateral. So throughout the whole session, sorry, here. Okay. So what I'm gonna show here is the average activity during the single uh, session. And it is 
and you will see that there will be a red light coming in the middle of the movie. This one, the animal is center pole. So let's look together. The animal is moving around and there is some fluctuations in the cerebral uh, uh, blood volume. And then the animal had, had fix in the middle and then you have this nice organized activity. And then it leaves, go to the side poke and then moves again. Okay. So it's pretty stable. Okay, this is stable in one session, but is it just to, uh, to give you an idea, these rats, I train them for six months and I would like to keep using them. So I don't want to use them only for one session or for more, for, many, for months. So looking at the long-term stability in this, in this rat, we are able to, basically I'm having here comparing between just overlapping the uh, anatomical landmarks. And uh, needless to say that the atlases I'm showing here are aligned to, um, again, uh, our own in Princeton uh, brain uh, standardized rat atlas. So between two days, we get a quite of an overlap. You can see even here, this is the blue and, and red. And even two months, we can keep recording uh, from the same animal. And um, we, we have a procedure to protect the craniotomy over this very long uh, time. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna uh, um, present some of the analysis you can do with this um, uh, brain dynamics in the context of evidence accumulation. So one very popular thing that people look at is what are the choice selected areas in uh, the brain, the areas that are modulated by choice. And here again, we are looking at the same sagittal plane. I, I, I just keep repeating, so I know we, we are not used on looking at sagittal planes, and we can look at the areas that, are, uh, that have significant increase in the cerebral blood volume and mo modulated by choice. And we see in this is data from uh, average over three rats, is we have areas that are, we know that they have been electrophysiologically measured to be involved in choice and areas that we, we basically haven't measured from before. And the ones that are known is the anterior M, M2, which is this one, and retrosprenial cortex and superior colliculus. But we get a bunch of other areas, mostly of course subcortical because you know, in, uh, in, in, the, in the study of um, neurophysiology of evidence accumulation, there is usually a cortical bias. But we see here that there is involvement from the dorsolateral PEG, even hippocampus, and the medial dorsal salons. We can do something more even with this data. We can look at the temporal ordering. So are they activated in the same time or activated sequentially or in parallel? So we can look at the, the time to peak for this maximum increase in the cerebral blood volume. And we find that you have um, activities that is flowing from superior, this is the, the things that have been very interesting for me is that you have this activation in the superior colliculus and then it goes to the hippocampus and ends in the anterior M2, which we know is involved in the orienting toward um, uh, taking the lot, you know, this is what we will call the motor command at the end of the evidence accumulation behavior. But, okay, I mentioned that there are new areas that have been identified. So this has been good in, in the lab in terms of inspiring other, like, further investigations with electrophysiology. And one graduate student I worked with is uh, uh, Tyler um, uh, in the lab. He basically measured in the hippocampus here we are measuring uh, from ce 3 during evidence accumulation and he was able to find a choice uh, a selectivity uh, a hippocampal choice selectivity guided by this screening uh, that i did in the during the freely moving behavior and so this holds a lot of promises uh, promise especially when one does uh, behaviors where you don't know what the underlying brain dynamics are so to conclude, uh, the second part of my talk is that even we are still, still analyzing the data and hopefully you will see a preprint from this soon, is we are able to identify a network of choice selective areas that are activated in a temporary ordered manner. And 
uh, we validated that, the hip that there is hippocampal involvement in evidence accumulation by looking at this choice selected. So after having these two conclusions, how does the future look like? So as I'm moving now to a constant, I'm mostly focusing on, on behavior. Um, so I haven't really talked about my behavioral work here, which is um, uh, specifically focused on modeling uh, foraging behaviors. For, for me, I, I really think that we can overcome this whole training paradigm by having the animal unfolds their natural behavior, but not in, in a totally uncontrolled manner, but just by controlling the environment. And one behavior I'm totally obsessed with is patch foraging behavior. And the patch foraging behavior is a behavior in which the animal can go to one patch with that resources and move to the next with different um, um, resource levels, for example. And one using quantitative behavioral modeling, one can try to guess what is the underlying uh, algorithms that the animal is using uh, to uh, solve this problem without having to train it for, I don't know, six months and combine it with brain white imaging. This is how I see like the future looking like, not only for me, but I feel that there is uh, a lot of interest now in natural being. And um, the, as the question I got in the beginning, so what about the future of the ultrasound itself? So there have been a report from our uh, collaborator in Belgium, Alain Urbain, where he can do a uh, brain-wide activity map using 3D functional ultrasound. It's still only possible in the head fixed preparation. And here, what he's looking at is just the optokinetic reflex. You just, um, you know, flash uh, light and see the animal, uh, uh, the, the, the areas that are activated. And the areas in red and yellow are the ones activated and in blue that are uh, deactivated. And these are around, I would say, 123 areas as far as I uh, remember that are activated and this is like the visual cortex. It's not possible yet in 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 freely moving but already we, as, as I as have shown with the with the 2D imaging we can get a lot of uh, information. So at this of course this a huge amount of work wouldn't have been done without amazing amazing mentors and collaborators uh, that I have at Princeton University specifically Carlos Brody and Asaf Gazin Fars, my mentors Diana Liao, EC and uh, Tyler. Uh, with people at CU Boulder where I work with them on the foraging project. Uh, Daniel Takahashi in, in Brazil, he had been my you know, partner in crime in doing the Daring Marmoset project, and we are still collaborating on this. And Emily uh, Dennis in, in, in Janelia uh, Farm. And the ultrasound uh, project, uh, Emilie Massey at MPI in, uh, in, in Munich, uh, Alain Urbain, Gabriel, also Adam Charles in uh, John Hopkins. And yeah, currently I'm working closely uh, in the uh, MPI for animal behavior with Ian Cousin and my long uh, uh, standing collaborator, Jacob Davidson. I would like also to thank all the funding agencies that have made this possible. And uh, thank you, thank you for the invitation and waiting for any questions. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, anyone can just turn on the mic and ask questions, or uh, if you rather, you can just type your question in the chat and I'll read it out. Okay, so, so in the meantime, I actually had a question just about then here about the technology. You showed us that there is a, a you can use a, the ultrasound to do 3D imaging. Yeah, how do you get past the skull, the cranium, in, in for, for the 3D imaging? Do you need to do, do So you still, yeah, you still do the uh, uh, craniotomy. So the biggest barrier for this technique, you can either thin, keep thinning the skull till it's almost like uh, removed, uh, or you just remove the whole um, uh, cranium. This is why they do it in head, uh, prepare, in head fixed, and then, I guess it's only two or three sessions. So that's why it's not really like, I don't see it for now very feasible in the uh, freely moving or more chronic or long-term uh, measurements. The biggest breakthrough would be to have a technique and uh, in a way there is this holographic uh, ultrasound imaging. The resolution is not good, but it can cross a particular thickness of the skin. I, I know- So I think you can use it to understand this foraging behavior, uh, just using yeah. local measurement of those slices. 
in Africa? Yes, yes. I, I think, you know, the local uh, slices for me will be uh, enough uh, because it's a new behavior and any, you know, uh, new, uh, any information will be already useful in the uh, Okay, so uh, our co has a question. Uh, have you seen activation in the reward areas? Uh, when are the uh, pigmental area, uh, the, uh, the comments related to foraging or social and non-social calls? Uh, yes, we, in the, in the red, because in the marmoset, we are not picking an outside the DTA. We saw the amygdala in, in the marmoset uh, activated during social behavior. In the red, I have seen DTA during the reward. If you align to the reward at the end uh, of the trial for the correct trial, you see activation in the uh, veteran treatment. Thank you. Okay. And Anna is asking, uh, um, she's saying it's a very much interesting talk, and, and she's asking about the time scales. And mm -hmm. there, are there any behaviors that are happening faster than the ultrasound can catch? I, I don't know if you mean to you in the rats or the marmots? Yeah, both. most, yeah, like, um, but, you know, most of the systems neuroscience have been uh, focused on fast behaviors. Uh, I think the opportunity we have with ultrasound is to look at behaviors happening over uh, extended, uh, extended time scale. Uh, but of course, if I, if I have a behavior of 100 millisecond uh, trials, uh, the ultrasound, uh, even if you do interpolations, you will not be very sure about what kind of activation you have gotten. Looking at what people did in fMRI, even with evidence accumulations, they did similar. We got inspired by them with humans. They did like evidence accumulation tasks that are uh, that have longer uh, trials to avoid this issue of um, the hemodynamic uh, risk. In terms of the relation to neural activities, there have been a recent paper by Matteo Carandini and Alain Urban. They basically did neuropixel recordings simultaneous with the ultrasound, and they saw it's the relation is pretty linear between the cerebral blood volume and the firing rate of the. Uh, Thank you. Question. So, hi. Uh, hi. My question has to do with uh, specifically with your uh, accumulation uh, data. Yes. And the. Uh, so we know that when you consider both accumulator for specific actions and the fact that the stimulus is uh, just pointing to both directions, we know we have intermingled populations and intermingled uh, representations. Yes. So how can you use your technique to separate those with your uh, resolution? Um... Intermingled, you mean like the, the click, the click induced responses, like a single click induced responses? No, I mean that even, uh, let's say, right choice and left choice preferring neurons would be found close to each other in both hemispheres. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so, no, uh, that's, uh, we, you just find like a, a blob, an area. And then that us choice select, like I said, you know, here you just look, okay, what are the areas that are modulated by the correct choice? Uh, this is like an average over a thousand voxel, which are many uh, neurons, but you can go further, do this with electrophysiology. So with two, two neurons close to each other, we cannot uh, differentiate this. But of but, course, but then, have, mm -hmm. no, so my question, can you see before the choice is made, can you know, can you trick accumulation yeah. for specific actions? And if uh, so, well. Uh, yes, we can, uh, because the choice is just the last, you know, you can, you can align it to all the time before, uh, before the choice. And what we can see, I didn't show uh, here, is to, we are able to decode, find areas that decode the difficulty of the trials. So we have trials that with different difficulties. Like if I have uh, 39 clicks here and one, I can have like uh, 30 here and 10, we are able to decode the difficulties, for example. And decoding difficulties is reflect on the accumulation process. Right. So there are more complicated ways to do it. This is model-based, like taking the drift diffusion model we used to fit to the that and then backwardly fit this to the uh, uh, hemodynamic, uh, uh, hemodynamics. And, and yeah, in the process of uh, doing this, it's not, uh, it's not easy. So, uh, Ahmed, so, uh, so, so at the beginning you showed that you have it, uh, technically enough resolution to image uh, different barrels in the barrel cortex. Yeah. So barrels are uh, inter-area 
so it's so it's 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 a low it's a high resolutions and inter area resolution right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in your so so when you're talking about an area which is involved in decision mm -hmm. you you set you, you set you cluster areas according to this criterion whether they have a uh, increased or decreased their activity relative to base time, yeah. this is a bit problematic, right? Because you can have an area which is basically has two different populations of cells intermingled, which is yes. highly involved, but you will see nothing. If they, are, they have an, an opposite effect, right? Yes. So this ha has to be taken with a grain of salt, right? All this, of course, uh, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah I, I never, yeah, I'm not advocating it to be used alone. I think it can be used uh, uh, in conjunction with electrophysiology to really uh, validate some of uh, uh, of these results. Because you're right, if you have opposing effects, then I will see nothing. Uh, but uh, this can be resolved by using uh, electrophysiology. So what we see as activated is, we know it's very activated significantly, but we might be missing other areas. The advantage really here is to, to get into the question of, you know, I'm sure you're familiar whenever you have a behavior, people spend time deciding where do we record from. And this can circumvent us some of this uh, by saying, okay, we screen this, there are potential areas that you can record from that haven't been studied before. And that was uh, specifically in the evidence accumulation task, this was very important uh, for us, where you see also activation and I haven't, you know, uh, in, in our data, you find like, Okay, activation is a pre-optic nuclei and a lot of the hypothalamic nuclei because the animal is thirsty and drinking. So that's, for example, is, is usually not uh, considered when you, when you study uh, decision making. I have a choice regarding to your answer to Iran's question. So mm -hmm. um, you said you were able to, to read out uh, on, a, on a single trial basis the uncertainty or the difficulty of the test, but from your example, it wasn't sure. It wasn't clear to me that you can really decode uncertainty or difficulty or just the, the overall number of clicks or the overall activity. In this case, there's no such separation between left and right. Uh, yes. So uh, first, it's not a single trial. It's a session. We can do this with a, with a session. It's not a it's not single uh, <laughs> trial uh, uh, measure. We, we have to use a, a, we can do this from a single session uh, to, uh, to decode the uh, 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 difficulty, but any like single click measures we cannot uh, really assess. Like if a single trial, like the way with electrophysiology, we do this, uh, like uh, like um, the spike average. You know, when you have this like aligned to the single uh, click, and wanna you wanna see the neural act activation that is being triggered by this click, we cannot do this very fine grain dynamics. But we can do more global measures like the uh, the difficulty or potential accumulators. So what, what are you trying to achieve? Just to find areas that are, more areas that are involved in the decision making or? Yes, yes. Not, the, not the neural mechanism underlying. Not the, yeah, uh, potentially to the neural mechanisms to, to basically see, okay, the areas that are decoding the difficulty might be the ones who are uh, potentially doing part of the integration process, our integrators. So we go and, 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 and measure this. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much, um, Ahmed. And I think you have several more meetings and for the, for, for the rest of us uh, next week, we were supposed to have an in-person um, in meeting, but it seems it's going to be either um, virtual or hybrid and we'll send a, an email to, during the week with the exact details. So enjoy the weekend. And again, Ahmed, thank you very much. It was great. Well, talk. Very thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thank you.